Great. Well, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to what we tend to call a director's dialogue, um, where the rules of the game are that I ask a few questions and then we throw it open to you. And we're thrilled to have Paul Volker here with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Paul was a student at the LSE uh, when I was born. Um, <laughs> 1951-52. He was actually a Rotary Foundation ambassadorial fellow. I don't think we've. I think they've died out. Uh, no, I since think they still exist in a they? certain form. I tell you, I tell you, I think that thing was for two thousand one hundred dollars, and I could live over here. I had to pay my transportation both ways, and I lived here for fifteen months on two thousand one hundred dollars, better than most LSE students were living at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, the LSE seemed to have, uh, do quite good things for him because he went back um, into the Federal Reserve in '52, and of course in and out of the Federal Reserve and eventually becoming uh, chairman um, and uh, was, uh, has been a great um, advisor and mentor to a lot of people. And in fact, I was reminding myself uh, the other day that um, in '97, when the government announced the creation of the FSA, I went over to the States and we met then because I was deputy governor of the bank and I, I explained uh, what we were trying to do over here and the, you then said something to me which appeared in the first ever FSA publication oh my goodness which where I wrote in the introduction I said I presented our plans to Paul Volcker who raised his eyebrows in the way only retired central bankers can <laughs> uh, you got quite a job on there he said I just hope you retain your sense of humour. Um, well, it was good advice. Uh, actually, I didn't uh, always retain my sense of humour through uh, all the years of the FSA, but um, Paul has always been a great uh, advisor and mentor to me over many years, uh, and we're delighted to have him here. And, of course, at the moment, he sits here with, on his hat, the chairmanship of the Economic Recovery Board. Uh, and so perhaps we might start, Paul, with whether you're doing any kind of a good job on that. In other words, well, um, have we got an economic recovery really underway, to use uh, Larry Summers' phrase, um, you know, have you reached escape velocity? I don't know about escape velocity. Sometimes I think I ought to have an escape velocity from the Economic Recovery Board, but that's a different <laughs> I... Uh, uh, the economy is actually doing a little better than I would have suspected. And I wasn't suspecting <laughs> very much that, you know, we've had a very deep recession. That's no news. We have a very big adjustment problem we have to make. We, you know, in recent years been consuming far too much, investing too little, too few exports. The economy needs to be reoriented. Uh, and we now, have, of course, have a very high level of unemployment. And uh, all that combination of events, including the sluggishness in Europe, the sluggishness in Japan, look like slow recovery. Uh, and it's been, by standards of past sharp recession, slow. Uh, we haven't had success in the 6, 7, 8 percent quarterly rates of growth as you sometimes have come out of a recession. But we have had, I guess, one 5 percent quarter, if I remember correctly, and a few 3 percent quarters. We're benefiting right now from an increase in, in manufacturing, which had a very deep slump. But this is a reversal of inventory, big inventory liquidation, to, I guess, some inventory uh, accumulation, although those figures aren't out yet. And they give you a snapback in production and helps the GMP figure. But the rest of the economy is not showing much growth. Housing is in the doldrums. Exports aren't doing much in this world economy. Business investment has not really picked up, despite the fact that one thing that came out of this recession is a pretty healthy financial position of non-financial firms. Yeah. The financial side of the thing is bankrupt to exaggerate. It's, it's very seriously damaged. But uh, companies, manufacturing and other companies, came out quite well. But they did it because they were very quick to lay off people and cut the wage bill, and they've been very slow to come back. So we are left with, I think, some, because no external shocks, or big ones, 
I think it's probably a continuing recovery, but it's not a recovery that's going to reduce the unemployment rate very fast. Uh, we're in a real slog here. And the fact is, I wouldn't like to see a great burst of consumption because that's where we got on the hole in the first place. Mm. No savings, too much consumption. So we've got to rely upon more investment, hopefully a better competitive position, get some more exports. And that takes time. And what about the fiscal position? Because here, as you'll know, as you've been here a day or two, that uh, that's the big <coughs> debate. How quickly can the government recover the fiscal position? In the U.S., you know, we, we tend to say, oh, well, the U.S. has got greater flexibility, but it borrows entirely in its uh, own currency, and, you know, the dollar is um, the U.S. currency and everybody else's problem, and, you know, all of that sort of uh, language. But surely the U.S. deficit is so big that it's got to be on your agenda as well. I mean, what do you see? And if we take too much comfort from the kind of flexibility that you refer to, sometimes it's going to snap up and, and bite us because we will get overexposed. And, you know, it always happens suddenly when it happens. But we are in this uh, dilemma that many other governments are in. The deficit is far too large. Uh, we can't, can't is a strong word, but I think it's pretty true. In the business situation I described, particularly the unemployment situation, a lot of excess capacity, and a strong action to rein in spending or increase taxes simply isn't in the cards and really doesn't seem appropriate. But you've got to do something to provide some reassurance over a period of time. So you do what governments do, you appoint a commission. I <laughs> noticed that, uh, I noticed you're going to have a new commission on financial reform here. Uh, but I, I don't think that's entirely a, a joke. I'd be very surprised if this commission, which will report at the end of the year after the election, comes up with a plan and says, this is it, Congress go and act this plan, and next spring we got a new budgetary program. I think that is very unlikely. But it can help educate the people as to the nature of the problem. And I tell you what I... And it's not a radical thought, but I, I think it summarizes it pretty well. For some reason, prior to the recession, with ups and downs some years, somehow our revenue system seems to generate about 18.5% of the GDP. And it's true. Tax, some taxes go up, others go down, but <laughs> somehow it always comes out 18% of the GDP. And it's done that for a decade or so. And spending was hanging around 20% or so. So you had a you know, fairly modest, by today's standards, deficit. Now the deficit's gotten to be 10% of the GDP. Uh, you've got a big stimulus program, and you've had some tax reduction. So how do we get out of this? Well, it looks like if we don't do anything about taxes, uh, really striking, it's going to be reasonable presumption, 18 percent of the GDP, whereas spending is clearly now on a higher track, and it's very hard to imagine spending, which is now, I guess, around 25 percent, coming back to 20 percent. You've got all the pressure of Social Security, health care, a lot of defense spending, and the momentum is very strong. Now, you can argue, are we doomed to 25 percent? I think that probably is not true. But are we doomed to more than 20 percent? I think probably is true. Uh, even with very strong restraint on expenditures of a kind uncharacteristic for democracies, you're probably going to end up with something, I don't know what, this commission will have a view and help us. But if you're ending up with a gap four, five, six percent of the GDP after all the expenditure restraint you can apply, you can't avoid thinking about taxes. And after the comments I made, personal income taxes going up and down, and nothing much seems to change. We already have among the world's highest corporate taxes. Uh, payroll taxes have become the most important single source of revenue against all our theorizing. And that's about it. Uh, so there's no potential in income tax, there's no potential in payroll tax, there's no potential in corporate tax. You're left with a new tax. Uh, and 
I think we are going to have to have some debate about what that new tax should be instead of no tax, which means I think a continuing. Well, you speculated about a VAT. In the well, year. I speculated about a VAT in the context of saying, yeah, we've got to have some new tax. What are the alternatives? I think you could argue that a carbon tax, pretty stiff carbon tax, would be a good idea for obvious environmental reasons. You could argue a pretty stiff energy tax would be a good idea, given our great longing for energy independence. And you are left, what about a VAT, mm. which has been historically poisoned? in the United States, but the rest of the world has it, and the rest of the developed world has it. very popular here. <laughs> uh, so there we are. Do we, will we really face up to a new tax? And I, I think it would be interesting what this commission says. I don't see how we can avoid a debate about it. Can I just uh, turn to Europe for a, a moment? Um, one thing that's been uh, slightly surprising to some of us is the president has been clearly quite engaged in uh, what's been going on in Europe. He's been calling up European leaders to encourage them to agree a uh, deal got a president, whatever else you think of him, he's engaged in a lot of things, I tell you. <laughs> I, uh, uh, but, but, I mean, is this uh, seen, the, the, the travails of the euro uh, seen from the US, how does that look? I mean, does it look as if uh, what has been done over the weekend has been enough to stabilize the situation? Well, over the weekend, I was in Ireland fishing, so I'm in no position to see <laughs> what the view was. Uh, fishing unsatisfactorily, if I may say so. Uh, but I think the general view in the United States has not been terribly sympathetic about the euro. And so if you look at the kind of professional attitude, the economist attitude, it's going to be in good part, I told you so kind of thing, that it was going to fall apart. Now, that happens to not be my attitude. I was one of the, rightly or wrongly, I was one of the few people in the United States of, who were considered economists and had public experience and thought the euro was a good idea and that it would avoid a lot of tensions and instability within Europe. And I took the record of the past 10 years as kind of confirmation of that view. Now, even in the midst of crisis, if you hadn't had the euro, God knows how much exchange rate uh, volatility there would be and how much uh, uh, grumbling or more antagonism there would be in Europe about uh, changes in exchange rates and inflation rates and all the rest. But clearly, I, I think we have to say that the euro failed or fell into a trap that was evident at the beginning. If you're going to have a common currency and you're going to have a common monetary policy and you don't have a common government particularly, will those countries that needed to make some pretty basic economic adjustments adjust and would they avoid fiscal uh, programs inconsistent with uh, maintaining confidence in their economy? And to some degree, as you know, those problems were anticipated with the stability pact, and the Germans took the very awkward position and not more than 3%, until they ran more than 3%, and that, that restraint kind of went by the boards in the midst of crisis, and I think this is the big problem of the Euro, the hope or expectation that there be some more basic economic adjustment in countries like Greece uh, that needed a more competitive economy. They had 10 years to get to work, and those 10 years were, in a sense, wasted, and you're left with this kind of exis existential crisis in, uh, in the euro. Uh, and which way? saying anything particularly radical, but Europe is going to force to react. Their first reaction is to buy time with this enormous uh, support program, paralleling kind of the reaction of the authorities to the earlier crisis. And the Europeans got their act together and provide a massive support which provides time. But if the time isn't used very constructively, it doesn't cure the problem. So uh, I think Europe's going to have to decide in the end whether, in fact, to get more integrated or to get less integrated and, mm. 
in which case you're all comes into question. Are you worried about the effect of uh, what's gone on in the last year or two, and particularly this latest European fuss on central bank independence? I mean, it's arguable that you know, the ECB, well, they have now got into buying government bonds. The Bank of England's been doing that for some time. You know, is this sort of eating away at the concept of central bank independence, which is something that you... Well, you know, I, I don't like it. Uh, but the, what was the alternative in the midst of crisis? And, you know, these are very extraordinary times. And I don't think the central banks have sold their souls by any means. I mean, this is not a period when central bank independence is important to restrain inflation. There's no inflationary pressure in any any of these areas. If there were and the central bank didn't stand up to it, then I get worried. But I think they're responding to a massive crisis and almost inevitably uh, their policies had to take account of the crisis, which was the national financial crisis that required cooperation. Can we chip track a little bit to the um, regulatory reform, which uh, you've been taking quite an interest in? I mean, first of all, in terms of the legislative program in the US, you know, there was a point where the Dodd bill seemed like it wasn't going to get anywhere, and then suddenly it's now being active discussion. What's your expectation well, about that? My expectation is that uh, it's got a good chance of passage. There seems to be a certain momentum. The key element is whether it includes certain proposals that I've been <laughs> associated with. But it does on a number of... There are a lot of th th things in the bill that I'm not enamored by. It's a big, complicated bill. But on some basic points, it, it you know has some reforms that I think are necessary and deserves uh, support. And... I must say this Goldman Sachs business helped uh, remove some doubts that people might have had. Uh, quite coincidental, I was Yeah, uh, quite yeah. coincidental. Uh, you know, at one point it looked like it might get all, several weeks ago, it looked like it might get entrapped in this political polarization. Hmm. And the Republicans obviously debated, should we oppose absolutely everything that Mr. Obama's in favor of, uh, because that's good politics. But as the kind of financial repercussions uh, seem to be continuing, I think for that or other reasons, that's we thought, and there will not be a blanket polarization uh, across the board on this issue, which accounts, I think, for the feeling that prospects are improving. And I think they are improving. And there isn't, there's enough similarity between the Senate bill and the House bill that was passed last year, that I think it's fair to assume there's not going to be a big contest in, in so-called conference bringing the bills together. So I think the prospects look a lot better now than they did. So you expect something before the summer? Yeah. Well, before the summer, you say? Summer begins June 15th? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> About that time. Not before, before the All-Star break. Certainly yeah, before maybe. the Congress goes home on recess in August. Right. And you get fully entrapped in the electoral cycle. So I think you get something in a couple of months. You said there were bits of it you didn't like? What well, would you rather not have? I mean, this, I'm not going to make a big issue of it, but you were, you were discussing just coming up here the role of the Bank of England and potential role and kind of oversight over the system. And I thought that was the proper role for the Federal Reserve, frankly, in the United States. And that's not the way they have the... They have the system, they have the purpose, the uh, a policy that you need some oversight, but it's lodged in the Treasury primarily with a, a council of regulators that are going to vote on measures and so forth. So the function is there. I would have arranged it somewhat uh, differently, obviously. Uh, there are other, not much in the bill done about credit rating agencies or other uh, lapses. I, the whole organization of the regulatory apparatus, I would do somewhat differently, but, uh, you know, that's, I, I'm not going to quibble about every issue in the bill. There was a point two months ago where it looked like the Federal Reserve would be removed from regulatory authority, which I thought was a big mistake, and I'm alone in that, and became fairly vocal on it. That, surprising now, is almost reversing. 
uh, the Federal Reserve has a big role in regulating big institutions. And I just got word today that they're going to maintain a role in regulating small institutions. They had a vote yesterday in the Senate, and the Federal Reserve won. So uh, they've gone from losing everything to <laughs> degrading. There are changes in the Federal Reserve Act that are questionable. Uh, how the presidents of the Federal Reserve Act are, are elected or appointed little quirk where they're going to give the president the appointment of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is, doesn't fit <laughs> quite nightly in the mm -hmm. Federal Reserve context, but uh, I'm sure that look, the bill is only 1,300 pages long, mm -hmm. and I've examined maybe 20. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about one you presumably have examined, and that's section 619. <laughs> no, section 619. You know is the a, section number better than I, but I can imagine what you're well, talking Well, it about. was, uh, that's the one, I mean, originally, it may have changed the number, but these things happen to uh, from time to time. But this is the one which instructs the new Financial Stability Oversight Council to issue rules that prohibit proprietary trading by an insured depository institution, a company that controls an insured depository institution, or is treated as a bank holding company. And that's also says you can't do proprietary trading unless it's market making or on behalf of a, a customer you can't sponsor or invest in it. This is your rule. Is it? That's it. Um, is that, do you think that's going to go through as you hatched it? Well, it's being debated today, so I will hold my breath a little bit on it, <laughs> but uh, I think the prospects are pretty good. There are little modifications that you know, don't affect uh, uh, the essence of the thing. Uh, I could go into those, but I, I, I don't think it's necessary. But let me give you the rationale for this, because I think it's misunderstood often uh, in the United States, and certainly in the press I see here. It's kind of viewed as, okay, these proprietary activities are risky, and they present a big risk to the banking system, therefore they ought to be prohibited. Well, they are risky, but in fact the biggest risk that banks take in my experience, in the future, of making loans. These are not the most risky things they do under some kind of uh, reasonable control. But that comes back to the whole regulatory philosophy. What is the big problem that's emerged, arguably before the crisis, but has been enormously reinforced by the reaction to the crisis? You had a big crisis that affected non-banks as much, and maybe more than banks. Governmental response was to pour trillions of dollars into the system to protect the system, protecting the big insurance company, protecting investment banks, protecting commercial banks too, but projected, protecting all sorts of institutions. Now, what are the implications of that for the future? Are we protecting banks, inst not just banks, institutions too big to fail? Are we committed to that in the future? Will that control people's expectations and behavior, leaving you with this enormous problem of so-called moral hazard? I think it's a real problem. We do nothing, that expectation remains, we're headed for a bigger crisis down the road, not too far down the road, because if creditors feel protected, if management feels protected, stockholders feel protected, why not take big risks when we get richly rewarded from these risks with huge bonuses and stock options and all the rest. But this is kind of the central problem that we're all grappling with. So uh, how do we inject some risk into the systems, uh, some risk that the government won't come riding to the rescue? Uh, there's common, fairly common view around the world, and this should be done consistently around the world, for something that in this bill is called a resolution authority. In this case, some agency, in our case it would be the FDIC, could intervene in a failing financial institution, take it over promptly under certain procedures that could be triggered very quickly, deal with uh, the immediate financial needs of the institution and in paying its workers or paying off obligations coming due literally the next day or the following day, but with the sole purpose and the legislative command to liquidate that institution. The idea is once it gets into the grasp of the resolution authority, it is gone. 
as an institution. Now pieces of it might be sold and merged. But the stockholders are gone, the management is gone, and uh, creditors are at risk, depending upon the end of the day, how many assets there are to, to deal with the creditors. But that's quite a different expectation than so-called bailout. Yeah. I mean, particularly in this last incident where people were getting so nervous that virtually no creditor lost any money except in Lehman, which was even a bad experiment. Uh, stockholders were even protected to some extent, and not many managements were changed. So that all falls into this context of a bailout and bad expectations. Can we change that expectation? Well, that's the effort here. Now, what we have then, in the future, we have a set of institutions called commercial banks that historically have been protected. And nobody's talking about removing the Federal Reserve or any central bank as lender of last resort. Nobody's talking about eliminating deposit insurance in the United States or in other countries. And everybody assumes in time of crisis, every precedent is that, that liquidity support and that deposit protection can be extended. That's for banks. It's got this historical background. What's the justification for that? Well, in my mind, very clearly, these banks have very essential functions, beginning with something that people don't even talk about, they take it for granted, which is running the payment system, which is not, a, you know, it's not just a little clerical operation anymore. You've got a global economy dependent upon people being able to pay and make payments and receive payments with perfect confidence that the payments are going to the right place, receive the right place, do it very quickly if necessary, do it in a variety of currencies if necessary, do it with various forms of protection. Very fundamental to a global economy, particularly a financial economy. In the United States, the banks are still the principal suppliers of uh, small and medium-sized businesses, very important credit function. People say, well, you know, they're not so important anymore for big companies, which isn't true either. They are underwriters, and they provide protection even for most big credits that may be made, but it may appear in somebody else's balance sheet. But directly or indirectly, they're protected by the bank. And of course, as this period showed, they are the place that people go put their money as kind of last resort. Not everybody's buying gold or or putting it in their mattress, they, they want some place to put their money, they go to a bank where it's readily available instantaneously at par. Those are functions you don't want disrupted, and that's why they're protected. Now, I don't think that's true of uh, people speculating in a trading operation. I don't think it's true. We Hedge funds may, they do this, that, and the other thing for good or bad, but they're not if all the f hedge funds disappeared tomorrow, it's not going to cripple the economy. If the equity funds disappeared tomorrow, you'd have to find other mm -hmm. channels for providing credit, but the economy isn't going to come to a stumbling halt. And they all have their own risks. They all have tremendous conflicts of interest when put in a bank. And they have, there's a big cultural problem here that some bankers are much more eloquent than I that you mix the trading speculative culture of a trading organization with the more conservative normal tradition of an investment of a commercial bank, you have a mess. You've got a institution, you know, the proverbial institution made by blind men that end up with a, a combination of a camel and an elephant or something. Uh, and that's been very destructive. But there is something you say that that's a particular U.S. phenomenon. I mean, if you look at the European view, I mean, Hans-Werner Zinn, for example, has, he said um, this would mean a destruction of the European banking world. Well, of course, that's Bologna, if I may say so. Who said that? Uh, Zinn. He was a German economist, Hans-Werner Zinn. German or what? Economist. <laughs> there is such a thing as a German economist. It's not an oxymoron. Oh, a German economist. <laughs> Okay, and the German economist says it's the end of the world. Right? Yeah, he says it's the end of the European banking world, and indeed even argued that it's more or less deliberate. This is the US actually 
administering this rule in order to break up European banks who are the competitors of the, your institutions. Right. Is that what you're engaged in? Yeah, well, the whole, this is all a hidden block, which I've only revealed to the small, intimate group. <laughs> but it's a plot to destroy the European banking system and to <laughs> retain the dominance of the United States in the dollar. That's now that you've revealed the real motivation here. Uh, no, I think this is something that the uh, European banks could accommodate. To. The fact is, you look at the United States. Now, this is, quantitatively, this may be different in some European banks, but qualitatively, I don't think it's different. The thing that I'm talking about that should not be protected. As a taxpayer, I don't want to protect the big American banks in doing trade, trading for the, you know, I'll put it to some brutal political terms. As a taxpayer, I don't want to be protecting these guys making $10 million a year for doing trading. That is not the business of the United States government and not the business of me as a, to support as a taxpayer. There are only maybe five banks in the United States for which this is a significant activity at present. Uh, now, those are big banks, and they have a big percentage of the banking assets, but even those five banks have only two maybe that this is really big business for. And they could accommodate two, but it's not going to undercut the banks. I think it would strengthen the banks. Uh, now, European banks may have a bigger mix of this business, some of them, but I think it's still a relative handful. Uh, and they would have to adjust. And uh, but it, if they ended up being somewhat smaller, and I don't, they wouldn't end up being massively smaller just because mm -hmm. of this, because that's not the major part of their business. But the other, I mean, the other criticism that Martin Wolf has, has put of your rule is to say that banks' investments in hedge funds, private equity, and even proprietary trading was simply not the core of what went wrong. But, well, that is, I think that is a fair comment, but we are producing, we're looking ahead, not back, I've got a comment about that. Suppose we don't do that. Suppose we say, and this is the alternative, we say, look, all these institutions, I don't care what they do, they all act like hedge funds. And uh, they may call themselves a bank, but they're just a big hedge fund, and, and they may call themselves an investment bank, whatever you call it, all hedge funds. So we'll treat them all alike. Well, what's the, what's the regulatory reaction to that? Well, we'll treat them all alike. We're going to have to regulate them all. We'll have to regulate them all pretty tough the way we regulate banks. And I don't want to go regulate everybody in the world. I want to limit the regulation, or the intensity of regulation anyway, to the people that are doing essential services that I want to protect. And I'm regulating them in the one hand and protecting them in the other hand. Now, if we don't do that, how do I possibly let some investment bank go bust and use this regulatory authority and and some big bank is doing exactly the same thing and being protected. In fact, I, I'm either protecting them or not protecting them. And I want to protect the essential part of the system. I don't want to protect the unessential part of the system. And I don't know how I can do that without separating their, making a distinction in what they're doing. But if you look at the system as a whole, I mean, Randy Krosner's argument, who was a Fed governor until recently, is that by pushing this activity, he says, pushing risk-taking out of commercial banks would have the unintended consequence of making the entire system more rather than less fragile. Well, I don't believe that. I, I mean, that, that is precisely the opposite of the result I would hope to get by pushing this stuff out into the open market, which it's not <laughs> all that big in the commercial banks right now anyway. Mm -hmm. You don't do anything, it'll get a lot bigger. But, because everybody wants a commercial banking license. You know, just get a commercial banking license and get the protection and do what we're doing. That is the ideal state for Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, any other investment bank. I want all the advantages of being a bank because they get protected, makes my financing cheap, and it, uh, I can lever the hell out of it. Uh, what happens, hopefully, and I would expect, some of that activity, limited amount, because it's not very large now in the banks, so it's not the center of the crisis. In the past, it hasn't been that large. Get it out in the open market where they're at risk. 
and they can go trade to their heart's content and try to make money. But if they fail, they fail. And if we can, if that appears to be the consequence of the risk taking, the risk taking will be limited. Now, people tell me, I don't know whether it's true or not, but Goldman Sachs now is, you know, it's basically a trading organization. They're not critical of that, that's what they are. They also have a banking license. So now they implicitly, and I think you ask people in the market because I ask them, they say, oh, well, they have a bank. Uh, if Goldman Sachs got in trouble, which they're not in trouble, uh, but symbolically a company like that got in trouble with a banking license, they're going to be protected. They've got a banking license, which ensures they will get in trouble <laughs> by some, some logic. So my logic is exactly the opposite of what he's saying. That's the way, by treating them all as banks or treating them all alike, you're going to encourage them to get in trouble. I think it's time I open it out to the, uh, to the floor. So um, who would like to uh, pitch in? I have failed to dislodge the Volcker rule, and I don't know if anyone else wants to have a go. Let, uh, the second row there, uh, down the strap. If you give your name, speak as clearly as you can to the mic. I will. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. My name is Philip. I'm a student of the MSC. Louder. Yeah. My name is Philip. Hi. Is that okay? So yeah. um, I have a question, Mr. Volcker, um, which goes as follows. So in a, in a planned economy, Prices are set centrally by a central authority. And we know this leads to massive inefficiencies and misallocations of resources. Uh, and that's why in the, in the wider economy, we've implemented this fact pretty well and, and let prices be determined by markets. But we haven't in the money market, right? Where we have a central authority that fixes the price, the interest rate, and um, is also the monopoly supplier. So, and there we go, we see misallocations and um, based inefficiencies into your subprime housing, into uh, the financial sector, and so on and so on. So my question is, and especially so if the monopoly supplier, the central bank, is also not really independent of the government, as you just discussed. So my question is, do we need a, another mechanism uh, than we have at the moment for money allocation? Do we need a free banking system, for example? Um, so is, is not the regulatory issues, is it not, uh, uh, is it maybe not enough? Is it not the real problem? Shouldn't be come on. free banking. Yeah, I, it, uh, I and the argument essentially is that uh, yeah. it's really the existence of the central bank controlling prices through the short-term interest rate that actually creates all the moral hazard problems, and therefore that a free banking system would be better. Well, you can argue that. I understand. It's kind of. A, I'm arguing for a free non-banking, non-bank banking system, but <laughs> yeah. a, an unfree banking system. But I. Uh, you know, you go back into the 19th century, the United States had a free banking system. And it turned out to be very unstable. The argument was that free banking was great for a growing economy with a frontier and poor people moving out, making a life for themselves, wanted easy access to credit, so create a bank. Uh, and a large proportion of the banks kept going bankrupt. And it, may have been a good idea in a frontier society, but people thought it was not such a great idea in an industrial society. And so we gave up on the free banking notion. And I myself, a um, product of my time, I don't think free banking will, will do the job. I, uh, you need, I, uh, these institutions may be too big, but you do need some big institutions of international scope and all kinds of technical capacity that I think a truly free banking system wouldn't produce. Uh, yeah, Guy, um, about so five rows up, uh, black jacket. Yeah, got you. Is it on? Can you hear? Hi, my name is Peter Chowla. I work with the Bretton Woods Project. We're an NGO here in London. Um, I'm interested in your views on some of the mac global macroeconomic issues that are facing the world right now. We have a lot of global imbalances, which have been clearly um, very controversial in the US right now between the US and China and the fixed exchange rate. But we face similar problems here in Europe. And, and a lot of the problems around Greece are around imbalances between the way uh, you know, Germany is, an, is a major exporter and Greece is a major importer. And they, and they have some systemic um, un in adjustment in this. And I wondered, you know, at the time when the IMF was created in 1944, there were proposals around requiring you know, both creditors and debtor countries to, to adjust their economies. 
and those proposals didn't win out uh, on the day, because of, largely because of um, you know, the opinion of the United States. Is it time to readdress some of that to look at some of the problems around China and, and the exchange rate, and as well as around Germany and Greece and the problems we face inside a regional fixed exchange rate system? Thanks. You know, I'm not sure I understood all of that. My hearing is not what it once was, but I think I get the gist of it, <laughs> that uh, uh, we've got big imbalances. They seem to run on for too long. The adjustments aren't made. What's the matter with the international monetary system? Uh, I'm afraid that question is getting raised with more intensity now, given what has happened. U.S.-China is one example, but what's happened within Europe is a, another example, and you can find lots of others. Uh, I'm going to make a self-serving <laughs> statement. Uh, we are getting a little interest in reform of the international monetary system. After a long, people, long period when I think people were not much interested, and we would had this kind of mixed system, every system at all, if you wanted to fix, you fix, if you want to float, you float, if you want to do something in between, you do whatever you want to do, uh, but you don't get much adjustment. So my thoughts went back to the 1970s, which shows you how old I am, when I was in the Treasury and we went off gold and pulled the plug, in a sense, on what remained of the Bretton Woods system. But everybody then wanted to reform the system, and we had a pretty intensive international effort in the so-called C20. And what occurred to me recently was to look at the U.S. presentation that was made about reform of the international monetary system. And the centerpiece of our proposal at that point, the setting was somewhat different. You still had convertibility or the hope of restoring convertibility of the dollar and currencies. But the, the centerpiece of the uh, effort was to recognize the problem that you mentioned, that you're supposed to have symmetrical adjustment surplus countries, deficit countries, but the adjustment, if it comes at all, is only in the deficit countries. And if you had the dollar, you didn't have to adjust very quickly and all that story that you know about. This proposal said, let's use reserve indicators as a signal and as a discipline for adjustment in both sides. And if a country is accumulating a really disproportionate amount of reserves, and let's say its name is China, it would have to take action to adjust. And nobody ever could have conceived in the 1970s that that excess amount of reserves would be a few trillion dollars. And you were talking about hundreds of millions at the most. But the world has changed. But you would have had some limit, and it said, you know, Chinese reserves passing 900 billion were disproportionate. They have to do something. And arguably, you would say U.S. liabilities, a minus reserve, had passed a trillion or two, and uh, the United States ought to be asked to do something if that was really disproportionate. Well, that proposal, we never reached agreement uh, for a variety of reasons in the exercise, but it, it's kind of interesting that all this period when one of the complaints was, are reserves really a good indicator, and how do you measure them and all the rest? Well, recently, they've been a good enough indicator. They're so grossly out of line that it would have given a useful signal. But all I can say is now I think it is worth some thought, finally, after all this trouble, of whether uh, some kind of more basic reform of the international monetary system as, a, as opposed to an, an association with the reform of the financial system isn't desirable. And that will not be an easy, quick decision. I, I know enough about it, but I'd like to see some, some work done. But this reminds me of something else, if I can respond to no question. I mean, this is an academic institution. <laughs> uh, you can make people, a bureau There's a lot of people out there. You've got, <laughs> you got a lot of potential PhDs out there on finance. And I, I've got an assignment for you. Uh, after all this uh, disturbance in the financial world, I think it's worth going back and saying, just take the American side. You have this immense wealth being generated in the financial system. Uh, immense wealth being generated for people participating in the profits of financial firms in the United States prior to the crisis reached for several years 35 to 40% of all the profits in the United States. 
and it kind of seems uh, instinctively something to matter. How can in the great large economy of the United States, the financial world, relatively small unemployment account for so much of the profits? And in fact, during this 10-year period, average income and the average American didn't go up at all. And income in the financial world was going up tremendously. So the assignment I have for any budging, budding PhD student looking for a PhD subject is a careful examination. You can use all the fancy mathematics you want or not uh, to examine whether there's any real value added in what was going on in the financial world in the last 10 years. I mean, I listened to some of these people and they said, my God, if we don't have credit default swaps, uh, the economy needs it. I mean, how can the economy function without all these derivatives? And I said, you know, I lived in a day before the credit default swap was invented and somehow the economy survived. It survived without CDOs. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Without you CDO's. had CDO squares, sure. Uh, and, uh, and the CDO squares and the 16 <laughs> tranches in the CDO <laughs> squared, you know, is all that stuff really adding to the well-being of the economy? I think it's a serious question that uh, economists are just beginning to look at. And uh, if you look at the gross figures, you look at the growth of the economy, if you look at the growth of productivity, I don't detect any difference in the years of financial engineering and in the years before financial engineering. If anything, it's slower now, but there may be other, other factors at work. But now we got a question. Yeah, there was a woman in the third, third row you had, yeah. No, sorry, it wasn't you, it was you. Okay, right. Hi, I'm Natasha Brereton from Dow Jones. Um, Mr. Volk, you said earlier that you thought the Eurozone would have to become either more or less integrated. And I was just wondering what direction you would recommend it to go in. Um, also, on the UK, you've probably heard that the, um, the gov new government is setting up a committee to look into the possibility of splitting up banks. And um, I was just wondering if you'd have any particular advice for them. Yeah, the first question was, you said that Europe needed to go in the direction of more integration or less. Which, which would you actually prefer? And the second, do you, do you have any advice to the government on the commission in looking into splitting up banks here? No, obviously, on the question about the euro, it's... It's a European question. I'm not entitled sitting in New York or sitting in the United States to tell the Europeans how they want to run the continent of Europe. I, I, I think this is a big question. I, I guess I said initially I thought the euro was a good idea. I thought it was a good idea economically, but of course the force of the euro in the beginning was a political force. That I think Mr. Cole and Mr. Whoever Mitterrand really wanted to see old Germany and France and go back to World War II and World War I and all the rest. But uh, Europe is, some, is kind of caught, it seems to me, between the desire of every country to remain independent and sovereign. Their sovereignty is already reduced by some areas of the uh, European Union. Uh, in this part of the European Union, that is the Euro area, uh, the restrictions on insolvency are even greater. But to put it simply, can you have a common monetary policy, a common currency without a common government, uh, to put it most broadly? And they like the common currency, and they like the common monetary policy, but they don't like the common government. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I really don't think I... I know, I know kind of emotionally what I'd like to see, but it's none of my business. <laughs> so, uh, uh, it's probably good for the dollar if you broke up, but I'm not going to advocate that. On, on this commission, on you've got a new government here, and uh, you know I, I would think uh, it would only take them maybe a week or two to decide that the kind of reform we're looking at in the United States was just what the UK wanted. But that hope is likely to be dashed. <laughs> and uh, They haven't asked you to chair the commission no, yet. No, they haven't asked me to chair the commission. <laughs> so I think they take a little time to have a commission look at it. But I, I do think what I, I really hope is uh, 
for a variety of reasons, the United States has not been in the forefront of these reform internationally. Uh, we've got a new government. What, part of uh, the problem is these, these terrible political problems in the United States. I, I, I pardon my emotion on this particular subject, but I used to be under Secretary of the Treasury. And in those days, we only had two under secretaries, and I, I was in charge of all the financial side, domestic and international. Now we got, I don't know, we got spots for six or seven under secretaries. But the two under secretaries that count for international and domestic finance, which were under one hat when I had it, both positions have been vacant for 15 months after the election which is a reflection of our inability of our government to function. And you might say, who cares whether an undersecretary here or there is not appointed? And it's been true of other departments, but this is a particularly sensitive time. In the, in the middle of a financial crisis, you've got lots of problems at home and developing and negotiating the system. You've got problems in maintaining contact with your counterparts abroad. That is the undersecretary's job. If, the Secretary of the Treasury can't run over to ball every two weeks. And, and, and so they send a junior person who was, because that's all they had, who might have been very able, but he couldn't speak for the United States and, and attract uh, confidence abroad that a proper person should. Well, now, finally, after more than 15 months, uh, after Inauguration Day, uh, we suddenly now have two undersecretaries in office. Uh, it's been, so I, that's one reason I think these relationships will improve. But if we have some sensible legislation and the combination of personnel, I think we will play a much more constructive role in getting some international consistency. At least that's my hope. Uh, Madam, the blue shirt on the aisle there. Hi, my name is Jan. I'm a former student here at the LSE. Um, going back to Howard's favorite topic, which used to be your bulk rule, um, even if you put aside the theoretical question of whether we should have prop trading in banks or we shouldn't have it, do you think it's actually possible to split it out and say what is prop trading and what isn't? Because if you look at complex institutions such as the big commercial banks, both in Europe and in the US, it's actually very hard to say which banks are mostly proprietary and which are market making. So how would you go about actually saying this trade is a proprietary trade and um, as such, it should not sit on the bank balance sheet, and which trade is because we are executing for a client. Because it might be very easy to say in something simple like stock trading, it's much more difficult in a complex derivatives book. Thanks very much. Yeah, how do you define prop trading? How do you determine what's held in relation to client activity and what is held from a proprietary point of view, particularly in uh, derivatives books? Well, I, I have to tell you that uh, that is a question I get all the time. But when you ask a banker, he knows the difference between a proprietary trade and a customer-related trade. They may not want to admit it in every particular instance. But to, to, to be practical about it, uh, banks, a few banks have had actually an arrangement that there's no doubt about it. They say, this is our proper proprietary trading desk. It should be removed from the rest of the bank, whether you can or not. They are on 23rd Street with a lock on the door. They are proprietary traders interested in speculating for the benefit of the bank making profit. Those things existed. Uh, I think they don't exist anymore because they can see the kind of handwriting coming on the wall. So that's easy. You just, it doesn't have to be, you know, I took an ex extreme case. It might be some, a quarter in the ordinary trading room, but it is the prop desk. Uh, you don't gotta have prop desks under this rule. And they kind of accept that. Or a hedge fund is a hedge fund, an equity fund is a hedge fund. They got a legal, you know, they got general partners, limited partners, general partner runs it, general partner puts in some money, limited partners. It's a defined organizational pattern with the bill passed in its raw form, it's bye-bye. And there aren't very many of them. So this is not, there are some, and two or three of them are pretty big. Uh, but it's not, there are 8,000 banks in the United States, and maybe 10 have a hedge fund. 
Uh, now the the problem comes on you say okay you can respond to customers trading in that respect you can make a market you may have to hold some inventory uh, to facilitate that you may sometimes get caught short for a while it's all true uh, and it may, it's a very profitable activity now when the spreads are so wide uh, even it's a legitimate profitable business so to speak a non speculative profitable business but there are telltale signs if uh, this is being used as a disguise for what practice on proprietary trades. Uh, is it a very big activity relative to the size of the bank and the size of their customer base? Particularly, does it show a lot of volatility day by day in results, uh, which suggests there's some quite a lot of position take, unhedged position taking. If you're doing proprietary trading, you probably don't hedge your position uh, because you, you know you want to make money. Uh, if you're suspicious enough, you look at it, and I think virtually everybody I talk to with experience in this area says if you look closely, if you're sitting behind a trader and following his work, you know when he's taking a position in the market, and you know when he's simply responding to a customer uh, inquiry. Now, is that perfect? No, but it's good enough. And you don't have to make it black and white at that point. You make it black and white when it's pure proprietary. When it's kind of a mixture, if you reach a judgment that the bank is mixing a good deal of proprietary trading along with its customer trading, Presumably contrary to the orders of the chief executive, who, of course, is following the law uh, and wouldn't want his bank to be violating the law. So he certainly has instructions to his traders not to do proprietary trading. But let's imagine that there was some mixture arising. I think it's reasonable to say that the regulator, and certainly this is possible under the law, the regulator says, look, in your particular case, you're going to get a special reserve requirement, a special capital requirement, because we think that you are engaging in trading activity in a volume and a character that uh, raises question about its proprietary character. And frankly, most banks I talk to say, I understand that, and that is the way to handle the problem. Now, we may have a big difference of opinion when push comes to shove about what that capital requirement should be. But this, in fact, is not inconsistent with the conversations going on in Basel that talk in general about a higher capital requirement for trading, whatever the trading is. Now, what I'm saying is something a little different. You may have a little bit higher capital requirement for trading in general. But I'm talking about what could become a punitive capital requirement if it, if it appears that they're really doing proprietary trading in, uh, in the guise of customer business. I'm going to take uh, one last uh, question. Yep, yeah, your hand. There's a check. Yep, yeah. with a sort of orange tie. Not quite sure what it is. Looks a bit of a sort of Lib Dem type tie. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was working for that. Victor Hagani. Um, question, inflation. Um, I'd really like to know what you think um, you know, we have to look forward to potentially in uh, long-term inflation. When you were talking about the different taxes, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that you didn't mention is, is that inflation also really could potentially help in terms of uh, balancing um, the, um, the fiscal positions. Uh, I, I it's, it's, you know, sort of a, you know, a stealth tax, um, which, which perhaps makes it uh, a lot more palatable. So. You know, we have a lot to uh, we have a lot to be um, thankful um, to you for in terms of beating the back of inflation. And I just felt that uh, before uh, today was out, that to not ask you about inflation would be, uh, you know, a, a tremendous miss on the part of the audience. Thanks. Well, I got asked a question uh, like this last night in a somewhat smaller group. Of, at that point, we were raising money to save salmon, but. Uh, we got engaged in a conversation about, uh, about the financial system, and the last question I got was, what about inflation in the United States? Is that going to come back? 
And the answer that immediately sprung to my mind, which is maybe all I know about the situation, is not in my lifetime. But <laughs> <laughs> well, this could be since you only got married a few months ago. This could <laughs> be uh, quite a long period. Quite a long period ahead. Yeah. Uh, look, we we are going to have to uh, wind up because uh, there's another uh, lecture in here at six thirty. So I'm going to ask you to do uh, what financial institutions do when they meet a crisis, which is rush to the exit. Um, and so uh, this is my advice to you, but before you do, I really want on your behalf to thank Paul for coming. <laughs>